When we see your face and your voice we will hear And then we will sing to Jesus the King The maker, creator of everything And we know that you are the Savior And we know that you are the Son and we know that you are the Savior of everyone. We praise you, O oh Lord, for the love that you give and the time that you spend on this world for our sins. We lift up your name in honor and praise. In Jesus we place all our love and our faith. And we know that you are the Savior, and we know that you are the Son, and we know that you are the Savior of everyone. And we know that you are the Savior, and we know that you are the Son. And we know that you are the Savior of Faithfulness, O oh God, you wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy, and nothing keeps us from our heart. So remember your people, remember your children. Remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Great is your love and justice, God of Jacob. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation And all your people sing along So remember your people Remember your children Remember your promise, O oh God Your grace is enough Your grace is enough your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. Heaven is enough to us. Your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. I'm covered in your love. Your grace is enough for me. the Lord, the famous one, famous one, great is your name in all the earth. The heavens declare your glorious, glorious, great is your name beyond in the earth. For all you've done, and yet 
to do with every breath I'm praising you these are our nations in every heart you alone are God you alone are God you are the Lord the famous one famous one great is your name in all the earth the heavens declare your glorious glorious great is your fame beyond the earth for all you've done and yet to do with Revealed by nature and miracle, you are beautiful, you are beautiful, you are the Lord, the famous one, famous one, great is your name in all the earth. The to see all of you today. Don't really have very many announcements. Uh, today will be my last Sunday preaching at St. Andrews. Um, we'll have guest preachers for the next three weeks. I will be available for emergency pastoral care through the 27th of June. Uh, there will be a reception following the 11 o'clock service today, and then your new pastor, Elizabeth Gaines, will be in the pulpit for the first time on July the 10th, and there will be a reception following that service for you to greet her. Do we have any news on how the, uh, the situation with the helping of the refugees went Thursday and Friday? Yes. Uh huh. Okay, so the furniture was put in the apartment and Elaine? Okay. Okay, wonderful. So the refugees came in, the, the family that has the apartment came in the next day and there was enough extra furniture to, for a help, to help another refugee family. Right, exactly. So good job, St. Andrews, for living up to your call to help those who most need it. And praise be to God. Any other announcements today? Well, today is Graduate Sunday, and we will have one of our graduates at the 11 o'clock service, but I just want to read their names out and say a prayer for them. Kaylee Wurr and Sam Perez are graduated from high school, and Jacqueline Giles graduated from Appalachian State University. Those are our three graduates for this year. And let me say a prayer for them right now. Let us pray. Gracious God, surround our graduates with your grace. Bless them with hope so that they move into the future with eager and open hearts. Help them to put all the knowledge and skills and insights they've gained through their education to use for the good of everyone. Inspire them to continue to believe in the goodness of life even when faced with life's challenges and difficulties. As they move into this new chapter of life, may they grow ever more grateful, compassionate, and wise. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son. Amen. Any other celebrations today?
Then we'll move to our concerns. Please pray for Tina Garner. Tina's very, very sick. Um, Tina is on kidney dialysis now and uh, is not able to get out of the bed really by herself. She's still at the hospital at Wake Med. So be in prayer for her. Continue prayers for Brian Wiggs. Brian had a biopsy last week. I have not heard yet about the results of that. Continue to pray for all in our congregation who are sick or injured or healing from sickness or injury. And we add to the list of our cancer patients. Remember Ann Safford, who begins treatment this coming week. And Joyce Flowers, who's here today. Joyce was also diagnosed with cancer. So Joyce, we will lift you up and pray for complete healing uh, for you. We pray for our students who are studying abroad, Abby Cope, who is in Peru, and Miles Hunt, who is in South Africa. Any others that you'd like to lift up today? Kathy, I believe you had one. So the uh, death of a very special friend of the rebels. Continue to pray for our nation as gun violence is on the rise again. Now that the quarantine and the lockdowns have all ended and people are out and about, it seems that some of them want to shoot other people. So we want to lift up our country during a hard time. Continue to pray for the people of Ukraine as there's heavy fighting still in the eastern part of that country. Um, And continue to pray for all the countries affected by that, including our own. We are certain to see $5 gas before the end of the summer, and it's all because of the war in Ukraine. So um, continue to pray for all the nations that are affected by this war in Europe. And also, please pray for the churches uh, all out there in the land, especially the United Methodist Church, our denomination in a time of division. Pray for the North Carolina Annual Conference. We meet in Greenville starting on Wednesday, going through Saturday. I don't know exactly everything that's on the docket for us to vote about, but it's already been a very controversial year. In other annual conferences, such as the Florida Conference, which just ended, had a good bit of controversy. So pray for our North Carolina Annual Conference. Pray for all the churches that are seeing transitions in their pastor, including St. Andrews, St. Mary United Methodist in New Bern, and Divine Street United Methodist in Dunn. Any other Prayer concerns today, anyone would like to lift up? Yes, Jim. Okay. Bob Maribin. Bob Maribin. Okay, anybody else? We'll lift those up in prayer later. I want to thank all of you for your generous support of the church not just during the seven years that I've been your pastor, but since this church was founded, uh, you would not be able to do all that you have done if God had not inspired you to open your hearts and sometimes your pocketbooks. So thank you so much for the financial support that you've given to the mission and ministry of this church. Um, There's a basket at the back if you'd like to give something today and you're able to do so, or you can always go online to www.standrewsumc.org. The green button at the top of our website guides you through the online giving process. Again, thank you for your generosity. There are two passages of scripture today, and I will be reading both of them uh, later in the service as we go through the sermon. And those two passages are Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 22, and 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 through 17. Let me tell you a true story. An overworked mother feels sorry for herself because she seems invisible to those around her. She feels like she's nothing but a pair of hands or a TV guide or a chauffeur, that she's not a real person. She feels like she's only valuable for what she can do for her family, not who, for who she is. So she's in the middle of a pity party and a friend hands her a book about medieval cathedrals of all things. Well, the woman is puzzled at this gift, but she reads the book and she learns some fascinating things about the people who built those giant cathedrals. Number one, nobody can say who built the cathedrals. We have no record of their names. We don't know who built them. Number two, the builders devoted their lives to work that they would never see finished because it took so long to build a cathedral. Number three, they made great sacrifices and expected to get no credit for it. 
Number four, their passion was fueled by their faith that even if no one else noticed them, God sees everything. The woman read the book and then she writes this. It was almost as if I heard God whispering to me, I see you. I see the sacrifices you make every day, even when no one around you does. No act of kindness you've done. No sequin you've sewn on. No cupcake you've baked. is too small for me to notice and smile over. You are building a great cathedral too, but you can't see right now what it will become. Commenting on her role as a wife and mother, the woman continues. I keep the proper perspective when I see myself as a builder, as somebody who shows up at a job that they'll never see finished to work on something that their name will never be on. Now, I've actually told you that same story once before. It was on a Mother's Day many years ago. But as I come to the end of my time as your pastor, the story really speaks to me again. So today I want to talk to you about cathedrals. And I'll start by sharing with you a little bit of what I've learned about them. It's going to sound like a history or architecture lesson, but bear with me. There's a point to all of it. First, the word itself, cathedral. A cathedral is not just any big church. The Latin word cathedra means chair. And in the early church, the cathedra was specifically the chair where the bishop sat. Bishop sat in the cathedra. In the early years of the church, a large church in an area would be designated the bishop's headquarters where the bishop's chair would be. So it was known as the cathedral. Sometimes they would build a brand new big church to put that bishop's seat in. And that's how the cathedrals were built. When Christianity became legal about 1,700 years ago, believers began to build their own churches. Up to that point, They either had to buy a building and use it as a church or they met in people's houses. But starting in 313 AD, they could build their own churches. The earliest cathedrals were modeled after Roman law courts because that was the the plan. And many times they had been meeting in these courts. And the Roman law courts, by the way, are called basilicas. And now today, some churches are called basilicas. You probably know that. Basilicas, Roman courtrooms looked a lot like modern courtrooms so picture the way a courtroom is laid out you have the judge sitting at a bench in the front on one side you have the jury and then in the in the audience you have all the people who are there as witnesses or spectators if you think about it that's not unlike the way that a church is laid out is it this would be where the judge would be if we had a choir that would be where the jury was with everybody else there For 700 years, cathedrals were built using Roman technology. The outer walls were load-bearing, which means that they were holding the roof up, the outer walls. Kept out the elements, held up the roof. And the roof was usually a dome on these basilicas. It wasn't a peaked roof. It was a round dome, which, which are hard to build. You've got to put the stones together so that they don't fall in on themselves. As the cathedrals got bigger and bigger, the roof got bigger and bigger. That means the walls had to get thicker and thicker to hold up the weight of the roof because it was the outside walls that held all the weight. Eventually, Romanesque architecture, as it was known, reached a limit. At some point, the walls were too thick or you couldn't build a wall thick enough to hold up the roof that you wanted to put on. It was simply impossible. So much pressure was exerted on these walls by these giant domes that the walls started to crack under the weight and to bow outwards at the top. So it became dangerous to build these basilicas. So if cathedrals were going to get any bigger, some new kind of architecture was going to have to be invented. And around 1000 AD, it was. Something called buttresses were invented. A buttress is a pillar that supports a wall, something that's actually holding the wall up itself. Usually it's, it looks like it's angled or even arched In those days, the buttresses were built outside. They were attached to the walls to prevent them from collapsing. So if you can picture it, here's the wall and here's the buttress up against the outside wall to keep it from falling over. Eventually, somebody figured out that the pillars didn't have to connect all along the walls. They could be separate and connected only by an arch or a flying buttress. So they would put arches on the outside of where these buttresses were 
And what this meant to cathedral builders was that the outer walls didn't have to hold all the weight anymore because now the pillars and buttresses could do it. So that means that cathedrals could get much taller now because there wasn't a problem of the walls collapsing. The new design was called Gothic architecture. And the pillars and buttresses formed a framework called the skeleton of the cathedral. The wall sections between the pillars were only needed to keep out the elements. So they could be very thin. You didn't have to have thick walls on a cathedral anymore because these pillars and buttresses were holding up the roof. They became so thin that they were known as curtain walls. You could put up a single layer of brick and that would be enough. But then somebody had a great idea for those spaces between the pillars. Somebody said, why don't we just, since we don't have to have them bear weight, instead of putting up bricks, why don't we put up glass? Let's put windows up in these cathedrals because they're not going to be bearing any weight. And somebody else said, and what if we made those windows out of beautiful stained glass that told stories? And so those old, dark, Romanesque cathedrals that had been built were replaced by these giant Gothic cathedrals, which would, would go as high as 400 feet. That's tall. And they would have all these beautiful stained glass windows around the outside, letting all the light and color into the space inside. If you've ever been in a Gothic cathedral, it is truly something to behold. When you walk in one, you just have this feeling that you're in a holy space. Now, Duke Chapel up at Duke University is really a mini cathedral. It's not very big compared to other cathedrals. You could take Duke Chapel and set it easily inside the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. But it's still pretty. It takes your breath away to go in and be surrounded by the stained glass and look at how high the roof is. The National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., if you want to go to a Gothic cathedral, go to Washington. It's only four and a half hours away. And be prepared to be amazed if you've never been amazed inside a church. It was built between 1907 and 1990, which means it took 83 years to build it. I told you these cathedrals took a long time to build. It's the 17th largest church in the world, 83,000 square feet. That's the size of one and a half football fields. That's how big that church is. The biggest cathedral in the world is St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. It's over twice the size of the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. You could take the National Cathedral and put it inside St. Peter's. The, the St. Peter's is the size of an NFL stadium. That's how big that church is. The cathedrals are more than just big because until the 20th century, it would take over 100 years, maybe longer, to build them. For example, the famous Notre Dame Cathedral, the one that burned a few years ago, took 182 years to finish. Do you see what I mean about the builders doing work that they knew they would never live to see finished? They were just part of the work to build it. Even now with our sophisticated computerized construction equipment, it still takes a long time. I told you that the National Cathedral took 83 years. The Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York City, which is also beautiful, was started in 1887. 135 years later, they're still working on it. It's not done yet. So Vince, you think our building project took a long time. <laughs> it's hard to, compromit, to comprehend the commitment it takes to build a cathedral. The time, the labor, the money, the talent. The only thing in the modern age that compares with that kind of endeavor is the space program. There isn't anything else comparable to the cathedral building enterprise that went on in the Middle Ages. Let me get to the point. There's a purpose to what I'm saying. First, a cathedral is intended to be a lasting and unmistakable reminder of God's presence and power and purpose. That's what it is for. It's to remind people of who God is. In medieval European cities, the cathedral was the most prominent building. When you were approaching the city from a distance, you would always see the spire of the cathedral sticking up. That's how you would know you were getting close. When you went inside and you were dwarfed by the space and you were bathed in that beautiful light, you could not help but feel that you were in the presence of something or someone larger than yourself. So a cathedral was a visible reminder of God's presence. Its immensity was a reminder of God's power. And its shape and appearance were a reminder of God's purpose because cathedrals are laid out in the shape of a cross. You've got a long section then you've got two sections off the side for the arms of the cross, and then you've got the altar area at the top. If you look at cathedrals from above, they look like a cross. Many modern churches are laid out that way. I've served a church that had the sanctuary section, 
And then off the sanctuary on either side were two little rooms, which were turned into Sunday school rooms, but at one time the choir sat in those, and then the altar at the top. Cruciform is what it's called, shaped like a cross. A cathedral is a lasting, unmistakable reminder of God's presence, God's power, and God's purpose. Second, a cathedral is a visual testimony to the Word of God. Every cathedral is covered in stone carvings of scenes from the Bible. If you go, even Duke, if you go to look at Duke, there are carvings on the outside of the building. The stained glass windows depict scenes from the Bible as well. Stories like the crucifix, our stained glass windows do that, don't they? There are stories from the Bible in our stained glass windows. That's what they're for. You see, back in the Middle Ages, most people couldn't read. They were not able to read scripture, but they could be taught the Bible by these windows. They would remember what story was depicted in that window. The carvings, the statues, the paintings inside, the tapestries that they wove, all of those were the way that illiterate Christians got God's word. So one, what is a cathedral? A reminder of God's presence, power, and purpose. Two, it's a visual testimony to the word of God. And three, a cathedral is a setting for worshiping and serving God and being in fellowship with other believers. The cathedral was always the heart of the community. Every birth, every death, and every marriage was recorded there. So if you're doing genealogy and you have ancestors in Europe and you want to know things about your ancestors before they came to the United States, you go to the cathedral, that's where they have all the birth, baptism, death, and marriage records in the cathedral. The triumphs of life were celebrated there. The tragedies of life were mourned there. It was a meeting place. It was a focal point for everything important in human life. That's your history lesson for today. And you might, probably are thinking, so what? Who cares? Who cares about that? St. Andrew's United Methodist is not a cathedral, so why should we care? Wrong. Here's the deal. When God looks down on us, God does not see our buildings. God sees us. He doesn't see our buildings. He doesn't see the magnificence of those giant, beautiful cathedrals. That's not what God sees when God looks down upon us. God sees us. God sees his people. God sees our connection with him and with each other. We are the cathedral, not the building. We are the church. The church is not a building. The church is not a steeple. The church is not a resting place. The church is is a people. St. Andrew's United Methodist Church is not a building. We meet in a building. St. Andrew's is not a building. If this building were completely destroyed one night in a terrible storm, St. Andrew's would not cease to exist. It would just be a congregation without a building. St. Andrew's United Methodist Church would still be alive and well. A church building is simply a tool, a stable place where we can meet, a place where we can keep all of our religious stuff, a headquarters, and a staging area for mission and outreach. St. Andrew's United Methodist is not a building, it's a cathedral, a spiritual cathedral built by God. The foundation of a spiritual cathedral is Christ and Christ alone. The stones of which this spiritual cathedral are built are our outreach in the name of Christ and our loving fellowship with each other. That's what this cathedral is built on, loving fellowship and outreach. The mortar that holds the stones of this spiritual cathedral together, it's our spiritual life of worship and prayer. Our stained glass windows, our printed Bibles, and even better, our lives are all witnesses to the word of God. St. Andrew's United Methodist is a spiritual cathedral. God created this congregation here in this community to be a lasting and unmistakable reminder of his presence, his power, and his purpose. Our life together in Christian community is to be a visible testimony to the truth of the word of God. And our church family, not our church building, is the setting for serving God and being in fellowship with each other. It has always been God's will that we become, alongside all the other spiritual cathedrals in our community, the heart of the area in which we were planted. 
Together with all the other spiritual cathedrals, we are to commemorate every birth, death, and marriage. Together we are to celebrate our victories and mourn our defeats. And together as the body of Christ, we are supposed to be the focus for everything that is important in human life. Church is not supposed to be something you fit into your life when you have time. It's supposed to be the hub around which the wheel of your life revolves. Paul says in the first lesson today, Ephesians 2, 19 through 22, you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. We are a spiritual cathedral. We are a temple every bit as essential and magnificent as any medieval church. But cathedral building can be challenging and sometimes heartbreaking work. Paul ran into this problem himself in his own church planting ministry. In one church that he had started, he was followed by a very gifted preacher named Apollos. Sometime later, he heard that the congregation that he had built was now in conflict. They had become divided because some of them would not accept Apollos' leadership. They preferred instead to remain loyal to Paul. There was arguing, bickering, gossiping, fighting over money, fighting over the direction of the church, separation because everybody wasn't pulling in the same direction. It had become more important to wave the flag of a particular pastor than to stay focused on Christ himself. There was a Paul camp and an Apollos camp, and they were tearing that congregation apart and here's how Paul felt about the situation first Corinthians 3 1 through 11 and so brothers and sisters I could not speak to you as spiritual people but rather as people of the flesh as infants in Christ you hear that he's saying I'm having to talk to you like your babies I fed you with milk not solid food for you were not ready for solid food even now you are still not ready for you are still of the flesh for as long as there is jealousy and quarreling among you are you not of the flesh And behaving according to human inclinations. For when one of you says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters are anything, but only God who gives the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters have a common purpose, and each will receive wages according to the labor of each. For we are God's servants working together. You are God's field. You are God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and somebody else is now building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build, for no one can lay a foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, stop fighting over which pastor is your favorite. We did the thing that we were supposed to do and we're nothing because God brings the growth and the foundation is Jesus Christ. One pastor does not build a cathedral. It takes many people, both lay and ordained, over an extended period of time with God's constant help to build a spiritual cathedral, to build a congregation. Bill Sabiston founded this spiritual cathedral in 1965. Some of you knew Bill, some of you didn't. He was a true spiritual entrepreneur. He was willing to step outside his comfort zone and take enormous risks for the kingdom of God. All church planters are. Without his faithful obedience, this congregation wouldn't be here today. But he didn't lay the foundation stone. Or he didn't lay the foundation alone. A lot of people worked alongside Bill. And together, all of those people got this congregation off to a great start. I appreciate, I really do, all the sacrifices that the founders of this church made. Worshiping in a school building, it's hard to do that. I served a church that started off in a school building. Meeting in people's homes, having to raise massive amounts of money, a lot of sweat, a lot of prayer, a lot of joys, a lot of disappointments. The founders of this church went through a lot together. It was an experience probably unlike any they ever had again. The excitement of being present at the beginning of something that was going to be life-changing. But when Bill left in 1968, it wasn't finished. 
A foundation is not a building, folks. It's only the start of a building. The walls have to be built. The roof and the buttresses have to be put up to keep it all from collapsing. The stained glass has to be put together and installed. The tapestries and the carpets have to be woven. The statues and the scenes have to be carved. There's so many things that go into the building of the cathedral. It's not all built at once. It takes a lot of time and a lot of work and probably a lot of builders. People like Al Thompson, who followed Bill Sabiston. He was the pastor here when the first building was dedicated on August the 7th, 1969. He was followed by Stephen Johnson, by Doug Jesse, who became a district superintendent, by Gene Tisdale, by Lawrence Bridges, by Paul Leland. Paul Leland was the pastor when the sanctuary was dedicated on January the 18th, 1987. Paul retired as a bishop. Paul was followed by Jim Summy. And then Glenda Johnson, who was my first district superintendent in Durham. And then Richard Stone, who was a district superintendent. And then Ed Gunter and then Randy Maynard, and then Wayne Hicks. Through Bill, God laid the foundation and put up some of the walls. Then others followed, not just pastors, but also hardworking laity. Through me, God built something else. Only time will tell what it is. Through Beth Gaines, God is going to build yet something else, and God is going to keep building pastor after pastor, member after member. St. Andrews will either continue to change and evolve or it will die because that's the way it is with living things. Each pastor will use his or her unique spiritual gifts to build a small part of this spiritual cathedral. How does Paul put it? I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose and each will be rewarded according to his own labor for we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Paul says that neither he nor Apollos was anything special. They're just men trying to do their best to obey God. They had one purpose, to continue building God's spiritual cathedral. Paul planted the seed. He laid the foundation. Apollos watered what Paul had planted. He built on the foundation Paul had left behind. None of that can happen without God. Paul can't make a seed. Only God can. Apollos can't create water. Only God can. Only God can provide the sunshine necessary. Only God can make the soil. I've learned many lessons through 26 years about being a pastor. I've come to understand that wherever I serve, I can only build on the foundation that was already laid, Jesus Christ our Lord. So I affirm the truth of those cathedral builders. No one can say who built the cathedrals. We have no record of their names. The builders devoted their lives to work they would never see finished. They made great sacrifices and expected no credit. Their passion was fueled by their faith that God sees everything. In the United Methodist Church, we have a saying, and you may have heard it. Preachers come and preachers go. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. I confess that there are some of you that I never reached in seven years. You didn't get much from my preaching or I failed to visit you or a family member when you most needed it or I hurt your feelings when I said or did something you didn't like. Fortunately, Beth Gaines is a different person and she's following me with a different set of skills and gifts and a fresh perspective. She is going to touch lives that I didn't. She's going to reach people that I didn't and I thank God for that because God finds a way to reach everybody. Thank you for loving my family and for loving me. We went through a lot together in seven years, didn't we? Thank you for loving all the pastoral families who came before me. Love all of those who will follow me and simply cling instead to the cross of Christ, not to a particular pastor. Cling to Jesus. And if you do that, I guarantee you that cathedral construction will continue at St. Andrew's United Methodist. And God is going to surprise you with blessings that you've only dreamt about. Today, Paul has the last word. 1 Corinthians 3, starting at verse 11. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, the work of each builder will become visible, for the day of judgment will disclose it. Because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. 
If what has been built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a reward. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but as only through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy. For God's temple is holy and you. When Paul said you, he was always addressing a congregation and not an individual. You are that temple. That's both a warning and a promise from Paul. And it's also my final prophecy to you. Do you not know that you are God's temple and God's spirit dwells in you? You are God's cathedral, St. Andrew's United Methodist Church. May he build you well. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Eternal God, we thank you for calling us by name. In you we live and move and grow. We pray for churches and Christians throughout the world. Remind us of our common foundation in Christ. May we grow together in faith and in love until we attain that unity which is your will. We pray especially for our divided United Methodist Church and pray that you would help us to discover the unity which you've already given us. Build us together in Christ. Make us your dwelling place. Send down your Holy Spirit that we might know Jesus and bear witness to our life and unity in him. May we know the mind of Christ in order to speak God's wisdom everywhere, every day. Strengthen us to work towards peace and reconciliation in our church and in our society. Build us together in Christ. Make us your dwelling place. We pray for all churches who are going through change right now, whether growth or struggle, reconciliation or conflict. Inspire and strengthen churches in works of witness and service. Build us together in Christ. Make us your dwelling place. We pray today for those who have no home, no land, no food, no work, no medicine, no peace. May we recognize and serve Christ in, in, in the suffering and in the needy. We lift up all of those persons whose names we called aloud earlier, our prayer concerns, as well as others that we did not call out but keep close in our hearts. Build us together in Christ and make us your dwelling place. We thank you for all your gifts of creation. Teach us to share with others our time, our energy, our resources, and our love. Make us sensitive and responsive to the wounds in the human family and creation. May we give our whole life to Christ, for we belong to him, and in him we are united to all things on earth and in heaven. Build us together in Christ and make us your dwelling place. Continue to work your transformation transformation within us and within the world so that we shall seek first your will, your dream, and the desire of your heart will set the beat. For all we want is to be your people, asking simply that Jesus would teach us to say and live this prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before I bless the communion elements, let me invite you to stand as you are able and to move around and greet each other in Jesus' name and to pass the peace of Christ on to those around you.
we can come back together now. I'll bless these elements and we will have Holy Communion together. You can be seated. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, the Lord Jesus Christ took bread, blessed it, broke it, gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. When the meal was over, he took the cup, blessed it, gave it to the disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of of sins. Let us pray. Almighty God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these simple elements that they might become for us the body of Christ, that in participating in this sacred act, that we might become one with you, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Jesus comes again in victory and we seat at his heavenly table. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So at your table, go ahead and celebrate Holy Communion with your prepackaged elements. Let us break bread together on our knees. Let us break bread together on our knees. Fall on my knees with my face to the rising sun. Oh Lord, have mercy on me. Let us drink wine together on our knees. Let us drink wine together. Son, oh Lord, have mercy on me. Let us praise God together on our knees. Let us praise God together. Son, oh Lord, have mercy on me. Now receive this benediction. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsels, God uphold you. With his sheep, securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Until we meet again, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And God's people said, Amen. Amen.